One is the role of humor in creativity. Uh, humor is uh, oftentimes cited by experts in creativity as very similar to what happens when you have a, a good idea. Can you talk about that? Oh, absolutely. Humor is ha-ha, and creativity is aha. Now, you know, if I say to you, half of eight is four. Okay. That's okay, right? Sure. What if I say half of eight is zero, and I really mean it? Okay. How? You cut the eight in half. All right. See, had you ever heard that before? Uh, no. No, all right. Uh, I do this with audiences, and I watch, I, I, I'd love to do it sometime with a mirror behind me, because I'd like them to see the smiles that light up on their faces, or the twinkle in their eyes when they say, oh yes, half of eight. Now they're thinking visually instead of mathematically. You see, they did a paradigm shift, but they had to do that to make sense out of that. Now, when they did it, they got an aha. And I say aha's come in every voltage, from a half a volt to 220. Mm -hmm. And most people think of aha's as Archimedes in the bathtub and Sir Isaac Newton with the apple. But you see, you can get little ahas like that. And as we go through the creative problem solving process, people get little ahas, new insights, that become additive and come out with an entirely effective plan that they didn't have before, you see. Now, what's the ha-ha? The ha-ha is the same thing. It's when you suddenly see something that you see one way, and then the jokester brings you to another way of seeing it, and you suddenly see that. Uh, uh, what's his name? The uh, Kessler, Arthur Kessler, yes. called it the bisociation theory. He said two planes intersect that are going at opposite angles, and suddenly they make a bridge here. And uh, let me think of a very simple, or maybe you can think at the same time, of a simple joke that, and show how that happens. Why does a chicken cross the road? All right. To get to the other side. To get to the other side, okay. Now, you're trying to think of all kinds of profound answers, and then somebody gives you that very simple answer, and you say, oh, yeah, that's right. right. It was see, the obvious answer after all. Right. right. Or, or take, take a, 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 see, I have a collection of cartoons showing how cartoonists use the creative problem-solving processes to generate ideas. Now, there's one that I just showed, so it's very familiar to me. It shows a man in an over-width bathtub, over-length, over-width, sitting there in the water with the bathtub, with a piano in yes. the middle. Yes, okay. See? And his wife is over on the side, and she says, other men just sing in the bathtub. You see? <laughs> now, do you see how the cartoonist just used a changed situation, a magnified and, and distorted situation, to create Aha, ha And that's what happens in creativity. And usually, when we get a new idea, there's an element of kind of surprise and even uh, humor about it. Yes. And we say to people, if you, I say to audiences, try to get something that's going to make you laugh when I'm trying to get them to think up some new ideas in what they're doing. And I said, think of your favorite food, hobby, or sport. And now connect something from that to this thing you're working on. And their first, what the heck's that have to do with this? And all of a sudden, oh, yes. See, they see a connection, mm -hmm. and that's the aha. Mm -hmm. So we stand on our heads in creative problem solving to help people connect diverse things mm -hmm. in new ways. Mm -hmm. That's where creativity comes from, you see. And that's the heart of the creative process. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, for about 10 years in my long experience with this, people would say, what's the most important thing in the creative process? I'd say deferred judgment. Okay. I no longer say that. What do you say now? I say making a fresh connection. See, teaching people how to make more connections. Then when you add deferred judgment to that, they can make more. They can make yeah. lots of connections. Yeah, see, but you might, with your first try, it's a probability game, you might make a diverse connection that leads you to an important solution, see? Interesting. But the deferred judgment ups the probabilities, you see. Talk to me about why you think there is some resistance in the business world to uh, this term, 
creativity? It, you know, we've talked about this so many times, Greg, in our, we've talked about the name of our institute having the word creative. Creative tended to get a faddish connection to it. See, first people, historically, when I did first seminars with people, I'd say, what's creative mean? Yes. And they would talk about art, music, this, that. They never talked about anything but the arts in general, you know. Yes. And then you would get them to see, well, it also happens in cooking. It happens in business. It happens here. Uh, Abraham Maslow once said, I'd rather have first-rate cooking than third-rate art, see? Mm -hmm. Because the creativity can come anywhere. Because, is everyone creative? Yes. Everyone okay. is creative in terms of having the potential for doing things by making new connections. Everybody does it sometime or other. Some people do it a lot more than others. If you were a business manager yeah. and you were trying to inculate or in, uh, somehow integrate more creativity into the environment, what would you do as some small steps? Small steps. To get started. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of some big steps. Small steps. Let's think is, of big steps. Yeah. Well, big steps, send them to a place like Creative Problem Solving Institute. Okay. It'll turn their thinking around. Mm -hmm. See? I have a new book called Optimize the Magic of Your Mind. That book is designed to be a hands-on reading sipsy. Okay. It's, in other words, it's all doing, it's using the process, being led through it by me in a verbal sense, but actually responding constantly. Mm -hmm. That would be the next best thing. They could do that and gain a great uh, uh, bit from it. They could bring in a consultant to spend a, an hour, a little step, mm -hmm. to just bring some awareness and some interest. A little, a little bit of thinking about how they think. About how they think. Sid, can you briefly describe the creative problem solving process? First of all, the process starts with a sensitivity and awareness and a desire to do something. If you don't have that, a lot of people, uh, you know, just are zombies in terms of the way they are reacting to life and they don't see any desires or aren't sensitive to problems or challenges or so. Okay. So we do things in the process to help people to recognize that and deal with that effectively. Okay. That becomes a very important part. Then we go into the traditional five steps that people usually know. The first is fact finding. Okay. And what we're saying there is let us open up our minds to an even greater awareness of whatever this is we desire or a problem, a greater awareness, seeing more of it, yes. understanding, perceiving it in new ways. Yes. Okay. From that, we begin to formulate what we think the problem is. All right. And we usually start that with an expression like, how to or what ways might I? Yes. Because we want to have the person be forward thrusting in the statement that they choose as the problem. What, are the, what is the importance of um, the, these stems, these, these sort of uh, invitational statements? All right, in what ways might I has yes. four main points to it. First of all, what ways? One answer does not suffice it. Okay. You have to come up with it a encourages multiple. multiple. Exactly, mm -hmm. divergence, okay. Mm -hmm. Might, not could, should, very open, subjunctive, what ways might I? Mm -hmm. Three, I. Not what might the government do, what ought this, what, see, it's what might I do, and then the following word is usually a verb, action. What might I do to develop some action in this direction I want to go? Okay. Okay? Okay. So um, you start off with a sensitivity uh, and awareness to, that you want to do, or a motivation to do something Desire. about an issue, uh, some problem or whatever, uh, you go into fact finding. Right. You you've already got some facts about it, but you try to expand that understanding mm -hmm. in a greater way. Mm -hmm. And then you move into problem finding with this STEM word concept that I mentioned to try to ask yourself a question that motivates you forward moving. So in what ways might I? And then. Yeah. 
you develop multiple uh, possibilities in, in, in terms of um, what the problem might be. Yes. Before mm -hmm. you start looking for ideas, mm -hmm. what ways might I? Oh, well, what ways might I? And you begin to see, oh, I begin to perceive the problem 180 degrees around another direction. And you play with that until you open up many possibilities. And then you say, which one would I like to really pursue? Which one intrigues me? Which one might take me where I want to go? What's the power, if you will, of uh, divergence or multiple problem Definition. statements? Statements? Yes. I'll, I'll tell you an example, and you'll see the power, OK? okay. Because this is, this is a, one of the most profound ones that I ever had. I had a group that I was, it was in the third day of a, of a three-day seminar in a retreat. And these were executives, yes. OK? Mm -hmm. And they went through the process several times, all the way through the process. Yes. And this was like the final attempt to burn it into them, so to speak. And they, I had assigned them to go out into the woods even and see whether they could make some connections with nature that made them become more aware of data about their challenge that they're working on. And then I said, go into problem finding and make a list of what ways might I, okay? Okay. And then start in with brainstorming for ideas on the selected one. I come over to this one group and they are brainstorming. I don't see any list of what these came from, but they're brainstorming a question that's up there. Oh, what ways might I? Yes. And the first chance I had, I said, fellas, can you do, and they were all fellas at that time. This was, you know, today we have women in the programs as frequently as men. I said, which, where's the list that you chose that from, that what ways might I? And they, oh, oh, the, s the minute we started, we, realized this is the problem, so we went right ahead. I said, oh, come on, you, you're going to make me flunk as an instructor. Here I'm <laughs> taking you through the final run through, and you skip one of the major steps. Now, please, just for me, come up with 10, and then you can go right back to this one if you want to. Well, they really resented me, but I cajoled them, I kidded, and I said, I'll give you the first one, and I, in what ways might be, and then begrudgingly somebody else says, in what ways might be, and the third one, in what ways might we? And a fourth one, oh, in what ways might we? You see what's starting mm -hmm. happening? And then this one guy on the ninth one literally went off his chair. If I had a video of this, I'd love it. He said, my God, what ways might we? And it was a 180 degree shift. And then I kidded them. We got to get number 10. But anyway, he, he, they worked on that. But before they started working on it, the one that they realized was really the problem, he said, you know, Sid, if I had left here in another hour when we we're going to leave, and somebody said, how was that course in creative problem solving? I would have said, well, you know, Sid's a nice guy. He's kind of fun and everything. But I really don't know what it's all about. It seems like a lot of fun and games or something. He said, this is the first time I really understand. So he got his aha. Uh -huh. He got a big aha. Uh -huh. And he understood what the whole thing was. So and, and that's what happens. People get a ha's in different stages, depending. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in fact finding, sometimes in problem, and so on. But mm -hmm. problem finding, most people acknowledge, is one of the most critical because it makes them really try to do some perceptual shifts in their See thinking. the problem in a different way right. sometimes leads to a fast path exactly. to a solution. Exactly. Talk to me now about the, the next step. The, then quickly in, in uh, solution finding, we're trying to find all the criteria that impinge on the reality of what we can make happen. Yes. And so up to this time, we've played imaginatively. We've got all kinds of ideas. In the idea of finding stuff. In the idea of finding. Mm -hmm. And now we say, what are all the possible effects, consequences, concerns that might occur if we used some of these ideas? Mm -hmm. And we begin to evaluate them and choose with full awareness yes. of, of the criteria, you see. And then it almost flows hand in hand. From that, you begin to refine ideas to make them more compatible with reality, you see. Mm -hmm. And you bring them down to earth, and you find ways of making them enticing, ways to make them useful, ways to make them valuable. Mm -hmm. And we call that acceptance finding, the last one. Mm -hmm. And that is often one of the most difficult 
I would say usually, mm -hmm. aspects, because there you're going to build a plan and get it into action. But well, one of the criticisms yeah. sometimes people have of brainstorming, and I know CPS is more than just brainstorming, yeah. but one of the criticisms sometimes people have is that it doesn't result in actionable ideas. Yeah, well, if it doesn't, they've, they've brainstormed, but that's all. Right. And in the old days, we were guilty ourselves so often of taking somebody who wanted to have some help, and they said, would you lead a brainstorming session with us? We want a bunch of ideas. And we'd walk and say, gee, that was great. We gave them 200 they got, okay? Mm -hmm. But I'd come back a week later and say, how, you, how did you do with that? Oh, that was a great session. We had 200 ideas, didn't we? And I said, yeah, but what did you do with them? Oh, we're going to do something with it, see? But nothing happened. Now, if we get 20 ideas, but get them to do something with one of them, we're happier, you mm -hmm. see? We're, it, we insist on bringing people to evaluation, convergence, and plan, you yes. see? Yes. Uh, describe, if you would, uh, that last step in the process, uh, acceptance finding. We typically use a checklist like who, what, where, when, why, and how. Who might help us with this? Mm -hmm. And we might get fantastic ideas when we really open our minds divergently again as to who might help, what groups, what individuals. Uh, what might we do with the idea to make it stronger? What might we add to it? What resources and so on? And then where and when? What special times and places might we carry this out that would add impact to it? Mm -hmm. Not just the obvious, well, we get them, go into the office, oh, maybe we're going to go out on a boat and talk about this. I don't know, but I mean, you sure. open people's minds to realize the differences that setting make, that place and time make, and so on, and, and then why and how I'm going to do it. How, how many ways can I think of more advantages and build advantages into this? And how am I going to carry it's it almost, on? It's uh, almost, you almost could reterm it the selling of the idea step. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But you know the interesting thing? Oftentimes, people come to that step and they say, yeah, this is the selling step, but I mean, it's, I'm going to do it, so I don't have to sell anybody. I'm done. And that is the biggest mistake because, see, what will happen, the guy will go back and all the reasons why he hasn't done anything up to this point will begin to emerge and he won't do anything. Mm -hmm. So what we do at that point, we say, okay, how do you know you're going to do it? What's going to be your first step? And we'll say, do something before the end of the day today that moves you onto the process, right. into action. They'll say, what do you mean today? This, this is something that's going to happen next November. I don't care. What might you do? Not can't, what should you? What might you do today? And he might say, oh, I could jot a little memo to this person, or I could get this book out, or I could do this. And we start them developing a plan of steps that can take them to where they want to go, and then they realize it. I, I just one other example. Sure, sure. I had a very analytical attorney once, and his plan he had made up for building this cottage on a piece of land that he owned in the country, and he was all delighted about it. And when we came to acceptance finding, he said, what do you mean? I, I'm accepting it. I, this is what I want to do. Sure. I said, well, what might you do today? What are you talking about today? He says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to build this thing. Well, I teased him with it enough till finally, he said, well, I could get this book out that I'm going to use to help me. And I said, uh, okay, when are you going to do that? He said, well, when I get back home. I said, what could you do today that would start? Well, finally, he had an aha. He said, I could call my wife and ask her to go to the library, and we could be ready when I got home that we could do this, you see. And he began to get excited. Mm -hmm. about what he could do to move this idea into action. So it's integrating the, the process with the real world and exactly. doing things. At doing things and doing mm -hmm. something. I have a little cartoon that shows this guy throwing an orange up in the air and catching mm -hmm. it. Throwing it in the air and catching it. And somebody looks and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm juggling. And the guy says, with one orange? And the guy says, yeah, you've got to start someplace. See? <laughs> and so I say to people, What's your first orange? Don't leave out of here without a first orange, you see. What's your first step? And this is what we do with people, and they are so impressed with this because they've never been pushed that way before, you see. Mm -hmm. They think, I use my ideas, I get all this, and that's it. 
No, we make them push it into action, you see, in some way, and bring it down to reality so that maybe they have uh, 25 ideas out here that they still want to use. But this one that I'm going to start with has a beginning, a second step, and it's, it's manageable, it's verifiable whether I did it. Mm -hmm. And then I go back. And one of my, my, one of my first steps can be that I do this, and then I look back and pick out next steps from some of my grab bag of ideas, you see. But you push them into action. But action that is very carefully evaluated before. See, everything you do in creative problem solving up to action does not have to affect a soul. It can be all thought process or on paper. But the minute you do something, the world has changed. You've got a, a consequence and so on. And so we are very careful that when we get up to action. I have one cartoon that shows two trapeze artists. And they're flying off their trapeze at the same time towards each other's hands. And both of them realize that they didn't think this one through. <laughs> there they are in midair, you see. And that's where we're so careful not to leave people because they get excited about ideas and they forget the reality often. But the reality is just as important Absolutely. in what we do. Yeah. Well, you were going to show me one more thing oh, yeah, before well, we concluded. I'll just give you an example of just how simplistic this can be. You know, we're using this in programs over in South Africa where they have transformed a nation and using a lot of help from creative problem solving processes in its most exciting case study we ever had. But here is the other extreme. Here's a guy who had a job of tying three knots in a rope. And that's what he did all day long on this assembly line. Okay. And he tied the three knots, threw it on, picked up another rope. Well, it was a boring, disgusting job and he was sort of disgusted with it. But he said to himself, what does Sam Hill what, do I, what am I doing here? And so he began to analyze fact-finding. What, what is it I'm doing? I'm making a loop and pulling it through. I'm making another, pulling it through. And it's a silky rope. It's sort of supple. And he said, how could I make this job more fun? How could I do it faster? How could I? And he began to play with the what ways might I things, you mm -hmm. see. And then he said, well, I wonder if I could make three loops all at once and pull it through in some way, maybe, maybe. And he started to get tangled rope, but it wasn't working. He said, how could I use magic? And finally, he, he went back to fact-finding again. He began to look, and he began to notice that he made a loop, and he pulled it through, made a loop, pulled it through, made a loop, pulled it through. So he made three loops, and he pulled it through three times. He said, now, with that additional bit of data, how might I make that? How might I combine some of that, and so on? And so he began to play with it. And eventually, he came up with this idea that I could make three loops over my fingers this way and then pull it through. And he said, by golly, it works. See? Now, he then looked at it. He says, I, I want to tighten these, make them nice the way they want them. And I wonder how long that took. And he timed it. And he timed the old way. And he said, this is so significantly shorter and tremendously more satisfying to him. Now, that was solution finding, acceptance finding. He went through the process, and you don't talk all those steps. You just do it once you internalize it, you see. Makes it organic. And that's a very simple it's example. A classic example. Good. Yeah. Sid, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. It was fun being with you. And